I think it's so sad that so many people, and once again, I'll let it be known that I don't believe, I don't preach, and I wish I could. I've went through the Bible. I don't know how many times I've went through the Bible. But the way I understand the Word of God, I cannot uphold the doctrine of once and grace. I believe with all of my heart, Chris, that God will never leave us. Right. I backslid on him one time, and there wasn't a day during those times of being in a backslidden condition that I didn't feel it. I didn't have peace, and I didn't have contentment, but I felt him there. I knew I didn't have to ask nobody else. If I died in that state, I'd be lost. I know it. I know it. But anyway, thank God for his mercy and grace. But there's Christians, listen, we've seen them in our church. We've seen them in all churches. They're so close. But being close, Zach, ain't good enough. Ain't good enough. I believe that folks, I've preached funerals, Brother Jimmy, and I was talking here two or three years ago. A friend of his and a friend of mine, Jimmy, knowed him longer than I did. But uh, I preached his funeral, and the night, you've heard me tell this, the night before he died, I sat in the hospital with him. Clifford Kinder went to the hospital with me on visitation that night. And uh, I talked to him, and Clifford will tell you how it went, if he remembers. But I begged him to give his heart to the Lord. He looked at me, and he said, I'd love to, but people would say I just done it because I was dying. I said, there's no greater reason to do it than to to serve him because you're dying. Because, listen, he can rescue to a, rescue you from a place that you're so close to. Listen to me. Chris, we're one heartbeat away from eternity. We're one breath away from heaven or hell. We sure are. We can take one breath and not get another one, and we would be in eternity forever and ever and ever. Serious business. I'm telling you, church, I don't want to be close. You've heard the old saying, close always counts in hand grenades and horseshoes. Horseshoes, as far as I know, I'm not a big sports fanatic. Uh, I know some of these young boys and even some of you adults could explain it a lot better and maybe correct me. But far as I know, I know Kinky has played a lot of ball and different ones of you. Far as I know, Tony, horseshoes is the only one you'll get a point in for getting close. Isn't that right? I believe that's the only one. What is it, a leaner? If you get a leaner, you get a point. And, but anyway, I see people that's so close to serving the Lord, but yet they walk away. Here's the sad part. I see Christians that are so close to having victory with God, but they can't get founded like I was talking this morning. They cannot get established. And God have mercy, Bobby, if we're called out of this world when we're in one of those cold places and we're not where we know that we need to be with God. The Bible said, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not is sin. Now, let me try to preach this. Let's go to Acts chapter 26 first. I want to share with you a very familiar scripture. Some of the young Christians, some of the young people, I'm going to refresh this for them. And the Bible talks about, uh, I, I'll tell you, I love to preach about Peter. and We've talked about Peter a lot today. And Peter and Paul, it don't get no better. God took nobodies and made somebodies. God took failures, Jimmy, 
and turned them into somebody that was a great asset to him. So if you're sitting in this building tonight and you think that you've been a failure in life, man alive, you're at the right place for God to use you. God to use you. But in Acts chapter 26, Paul, and I won't go into a whole lot of the history beyond before chapter 26, that'll give you something to do when you can't find something on TV. But anyways, chapter 26 of Acts, Paul had done stood before several. Now it was his time to stand before Agrippa. In verse 1, the Bible said, Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. Wrong thing to say to somebody that had a great experience with the Lord. Man alive. Oh, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Chris, he, he, uh, Agrippa just didn't know what he was getting into, but he had compassion on Paul. And he said, Paul, you go ahead and say something if you want to. And boy, I can paraphrase and I can imagine Jakey that Paul said, oh, I was itching to get up and say something. <laughs> Hallelujah forever. What Paul, what a normal person would have done, would have stood up and pled with the grip and said, please set me free. Yeah. Please don't kill me. Please, listen, if you'll notice, I ain't, I ain't done anything worthy of death. And Agrippa later said that. But me and you, or I'm saying me, I would have first taken words out of my mouth. King Agrippa, I know you got the authority to have me put to death. But I'd like to go home. I'd like to, I'd like to go back to my family. I'd like, I'd like to live my life as normal. But the first words, boy, I'll tell you what. It's evident, it's evident that Paul was a man of God. First, he didn't say, please let me go. Please set me free. But in verse 2, Paul said, listen, King Agrippa, I thank myself happy. I'm here today and I'm so thankful and I'm so happy that I'm accused for what I'm accused of. He went on paraphrase and I'll repress and remind you a little bit and instruct some of the younger ones that hadn't been reading the Bible longer. Paul looked at Agrippa and he said, King Agrippa, you know who I am. You know my background and you know what I was. And he said, King Agrippa, he said, listen, I'm a changed man. You knew how I was raised and it was far from what I'm being accused of today. King Agrippa, you know me, and these around here knows me. And he began to talk to King Agrippa. And he said, listen, I'm on a side now, and I'm associated with a group of people that I once condemned. I listen, my goal in life was to persecute the church, to condemn the church, to kill the church. We thought that we could kill this thing out. But King Agrippa, listen, I was on the road to Damascus one day. I want you to know something very special happened. I never experienced anything like this before in my life. Many a days I looked up to the sun. Many a days I walked to the... Uh, through the desert, through the dry land. And he said, I felt the power of the sun in the sky. I'm paraphrasing them. Yeah. But anyway, he said, I, I've experienced the heat of the sun. He said, but this day, there was a light so round about me that far exceeded the brightness of of the sun. Listen to me. He said this light shone around about me and me and my companions 
fell to the ground. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice. And that voice said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Paul went on to tell Agrippa, he said, but the Lord, uh, he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Listen to me. I'm the very one that you put down, that you tried to do away with, and tried to destroy all of my disciples and all of my followers. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Keep in mind, Paul was talking to Agrippa. But this voice said, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Paul said, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly voice. But he kept standing there that day and he, 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 he was witness of two, King Agrippa's action. Paul's uh, motive was not his own. Paul knew that he was in trouble and there was a good chance that he was going to be put to death. But that was not his mission. Paul said, I may get put to death today or tomorrow. But I would like to see somebody come out of darkness into this marvelous light. And he began to continue to talk to Agrippa. And Festus was seated nearby. And all of a sudden, listen to me, Chris. There's people in our lives that won't listen. They won't listen. And some will listen are so close, but they won't make it. It's a sad situation. All of a sudden, as Paul was ministered to Agrippa, the Bible said that Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art mad, and thou art beside thyself. In other words, Festus said to Paul, he said, Paul, you're crazy. You've done lost it. And Paul said, that he said, but he said, Festus, I'm not mad. But I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. He went on to tell Festus, he said, For the king knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophet? I know that thou believest. Jessica, I believe with all of my heart that Paul knew that the Lord was dealing with King Agrippa. He said, Paul, Paul said, King Agrippa, he said, believe, I know that thou believest. And King Agrippa then said unto him, verse 28, listen, he looked at Paul and he said, Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Listen, isn't that sad? So close, so close, but yet the Bible don't record that Agrippa accepted the Lord. I've read a lot of commentaries. I've read a lot of writings of Bible scholars. Nowhere in history does it re record that Agrippa made peace with God. Take you to another familiar place found in the 23rd chapter of Luke and something that probably each one of you could stand up here tonight tell this story how that Jesus had went through the trial how that they had taken him to Golgotha 
how that they had hung him on the cross. And uh, the Bible teaches us uh, that they put Jesus in the middle of two thieves. And the Bible said uh, that being right there, being right there, the Word of God says uh, that this one thief that was in his last moments of his life, the enemy had such a grip on him, Chris. We witnessed it. It was so sad. People so close, but yet so far away. The Bible teaches us here in this familiar scripture, this man's heart so hard, moments he would, if the life would be gone out of his body, he began to make fun of Jesus, began to deny him and said, if thou be the Christ, free yourself and free us. He was saying that, I don't believe that you're who you say you are. But his friend on the other side of Jesus condemned him and said, this man, listen, you have no right talking to this man like this. He said, this man has done nothing. He said, we're getting just dues for our crimes. We're, we're crucified because we were guilty. But Jesus has done nothing. What a sad situation of Agrippa telling Paul, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. A sad story, Zach, the thief on the cross being beside of Jesus. Listen, he had proof there. In just a moment, he could experience. Listen, his friend there, in his dying moments, Jesus redeemed him. Listen to me. Jesus, when he asked Jesus, said, when thou goest into thy kingdom, would you remember me? And Jesus said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Listen to me. That other thief, Jinky, was so close, but his heart was so hard. We see it down through our lives. Many, everybody in this church could give a situation in your life that you experience people so close, but yet they left without a testimony of knowing Jesus. That's the saddest thing ever was. But now I'm going to preach to the church tonight. Listen to me. We sometimes, a lot of times, are so close to blessings, Chris. We're so close to blessings and God uses us. But we're not willing to allow Him to lead us and direct us that we short ourselves. We cheat ourselves out of blessings because we're not obedient to God. Now I'm going to take you over into the book of Ruth, chapter 4, and I want to preach there a little bit. When the kids was growing up, Jack, you can correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, I think it was one of Bill Cosby's shows, uh, one of his children's shows there. He had a, 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 a boy there that they called No Neck Norman. Yeah. Am I right, Zach? Fat Albert, right? Huh? Fat Albert? Fat Albert, maybe, yeah, but, but I mean, anyway. Yeah, it was a character, though. Huh? That was a character, you're right. But anyways, No Neck Norman, he didn't have no neck. And it was comical. But the Bible speaks of another man as I was studying this that came to my mind. And I thought, well, I'll give him a name, Norman. No man, no name, Norman. So uh, I'll call this man Norman. The Bible says here, listen, all this is good. I begin to study this. And I told you this morning I've been studying Ruth. Zach's lesson this morning sparked this message in my mind. Man, I couldn't wait to get home and get to working on it. But anyway, the, the, in the book of Ruth, it talks about a man, listen, that was so close to being in the lineage of David, but yet he chose not to. In chapter 1, the Bible speaks about uh, Naomi and her husband Elimelech and her two sons uh, 
Chilion and Magog, how that they left uh, Bethlehem and they went down because of a famine. And they went down to Mo Moab and they went into a strange land. The Bible said while they was in Moab, Chilion and Maon, they met two girls and they, they married those Moabite girls. And uh, listen, that was out of their league. That was not common. But most of you Bible readers know tonight uh, that in a short period of time uh, that Elimelech uh, passed away. And a short time after that, uh, uh, Malon and Chilion, uh, they passed away too. And most of you know uh, that that left Ruth, Naomi, and Orpha, Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, they was there. And listen to me, things was bad. So finally, Ruth, Naomi told Ruth and Orpha, she said, listen, I'm going to go back home. She said, I'm going back to my lands, and I hear things is better there now. The Bible, and some of the Bible scholars and Bible history teaches us that it got so bad when they was there before, when they was in their hometown of Bethlehem, that they had to sell their properties, might as well say, sell their farm yes. to pay their debts. Now, back then, things was a little different. We've got it better today. Uh, when somebody sold a piece of ground, it was like a, uh, a long-term lease. Right. When you bought somebody's land, you didn't really buy it. Yeah because uh, the original owner always had the rights to it. Uh, but listen, it had to be redeemed. Now pay close attention. The Bible said, and most of you know, that, that Naomi told Orpha and Ruth, said, I'm going back to Bethlehem, the land of my fathers. And she told the daughters and all, she said, both of you need to return to your father's house and try to start a new life. And the Bible teaches us that Orpha did so. But Ruth said, wherever thou goest, I go. And the Bible teaches us that Ruth, that Naomi, along with Ruth, made the journey back to Bethlehem. And the Bible said when they got to Bethlehem, they were greeted there. And we know the story. Brother Omer sang the song this morning how that Naomi had sent Ruth out into the field to glean. And for those of you that don't know, listen, that was part of the practice back then. They considered the poor when harvest time would, would come and the reapers would go out into the fields and reap the harvest. They would leave some things there for the poor. And the Bible said that Ruth went out into the field God had a plan, and she began to glean. And listen to me, she'd go behind the reapers, and she'd gather up the scraps. And the Word of God says, as Omer sang, Brother Hoy wonderfully sang that song. When she got in that day, Naomi said, Whose field did you glean in? She said, A man named, by the name of Boaz. Listen to me. Anyway, we all know, most of us knows that Ruth found favor with Boaz. Now, there was a problem. Listen to me right real quick. The Bible said that Elimelech's land was still there. He had sold it, but it had to be redeemed from the person that had bought it off of him. Like I said, it was nothing more than a long-term lease on the land. And make a long story short, Boaz fell in love with Ruth. And uh, the Bible teaches us uh, that the feeling was mutual, but there was a problem. Naomi being an heir, her husband's life being his heir, she had the rights uh, to her husband's land, but they had to have the land redeemed. Pray for me tonight. I hope you get a blessing out of this. Church, we do not want to miss out on anything. Yeah.
that God has in store for us. Now the Word of God teaches us, listen, they went in the packing orders, Brother J.R. used to say, the eldest first. And the Bible said that there was a kinsman. Boaz was a relation to Naomi, right? He was a re relation. But Boaz was not next in line to receive the blessing or receive what was rightfully his. Now, if uh, me and Roseanne, uh, being that uh, she's a girl and I'm a boy, listen, she's older than I am. I'm the second child out of five. But being that I'm a boy, I'm in charge. Yes, sir, I am. Paul had to go through me to get Roseanne. And I blessed him with her. I really did. I said, you can have her. Daddy used to sing a song. Said, old oh man, old oh man, can I have your daughter to bake my bread and carry my water? She, now, Daddy replied, she won't work. You can't make her. <laughs> yes, sir. But anyway, just throwing that in. I, but the Bible teaches us that Boaz knew all about this. But Jack, like I said, in all of my years, I've never heard anybody preach on this man. It speaks of him in chapter 4 of Ruth, the only place in the Bible that it speaks of him. And Ruth being only four books, chapter 4 only being 22 verses, the Bible don't speak his name. But some historians and some Bible scholars thinks that maybe he could have been an elder brother to Boaz or even a cousin. But Boaz knew that he couldn't, re couldn't redeem the land of uh, uh, Naomi because there was somebody in front of him. Well, back then, it had to be done before witnesses. The Bible said that in chapter 4, and you can read it later, that uh, Boaz went and got ten elders of the city and he got this man that I named Norman. He got Norman and he took him down to the gate of the city. The Bible said that he went down there. He said, now listen, I want to refresh your memory. He said, I, I guess you've heard that Naomi is back in town. He said, yeah, she's back in town. I heard all about it. Maybe he said I've seen her. Don't really matter. We'll get to. That's why it's going to take eternity, Chris, oh, yeah. to, to cover all this stuff. I plan on, listen, I plan on spending the first million years at the feet of Jesus. But there are some stories I want to hear. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Norman said that uh, he told Boaz, he said, yeah. Said, I, I heard Naomi's back, or he may have said, I, I saw her. And she came back with one of her daughters in law. And Boaz told Norman, he said, Norman, he said, her land needs redeemed. Listen to me. And Boaz, and Norman said, Boaz told Norman, he said, Reason I got you down here today, he said, You're in front of me in the pecking order. He said, the reason I've got you down here today is because you're before me. And if you want to redeem that land, if you want to take it for your own, listen, you've got the right to do it. And Norman looked at Boaz and he said, why, of course I'll redeem it. Yeah, he said, be a fool not to, probably said, uh, the Bible don't teach us, Chris, or chapter 4, that Norman waited, wasted any time. His response was, sure, I'll redeem the land. And so, uh, Boaz, I'm sure his heart sunk, and he thought, oh, my plan fell through. It wasn't a crooked plan. He was doing things right. He had ten witnesses there. He was doing things right. Now he said, there's a catch to it, Norman. And Norman said, what's the catch to it? He said, you remember that you brought a daughter-in-law back to Moabites by the name of Ruth? Yeah. 
she, she, I remember, she come back. Now, Norman, he said, uh, if you redeem the land, you got to marry Ruth. And boy, the story changed then. And old Norman said, now, wait a minute. I sure would like to have the land. But, and I don't know why he, well, the Bible says that he gives uh, Boaz a reason why he didn't want to re uh, marry Ruth. Uh, but he was all for redeeming the land until Boaz told him, he said, you've got to marry Ruth. And all of a sudden, Norman drawed his horns in and he said, now wait a minute. I don't know if I want that property or not. I don't want to get married again. For the big reason is, I'm afraid that it will mar my inheritance so close. Listen to me. Do you believe that God had a plan for Boaz? I believe with all of my heart. But I'm talking about by rights. By rights. By pecking order. Old Norman had the first right. He was so close, Chris. He was worried about fame and fortune. Yeah. Don't that sound like us? Yeah. Yes, sir. Any responsible person. I know, and probably along with all the rest of you men, when I was a young man in my late teens and 20s, and I know you coal miners, you retired coal miners, was the same way you, when you were young. You didn't want to hear when it come contract time and they went in, they started throwing this insurance and this retirement at you, Kinky. That, wasn't, that was the farthest thing from your mind. What was us young men want? More money on the hour. Yeah. Uh -huh. But anyway, as we got older, insurance became a priority and retirement became a priority. Now Norman was there and he had a right and he was ready to get the land. Norman was so close to a blessing and like I said, I believe with all of my heart God Almighty had put Boaz in the picture, but Norman had a right to it. And Norman said, I'll take the land, but I'm not marrying Ruth. And if I got to marry the Ruth, marry Ruth, said, you take the land. I don't want no part of it. The Bible, <laughs> Bible said that it was a custom, listen to me, it was a custom when men made an agreement when a, mark, when a deal was signed that they would take off their shoe. So, Norman and Boaz was there in front of the ten elders there at the gate. All of a sudden, I don't believe Chris, I don't believe he wasted any time. It's only one verse later, but I, I guarantee you, after Boaz told Norman, he said, Listen, I'd like to have the land, but I don't want Ruth, so you take the land and take the little woman too. I believe the whole time he was saying that, James, he was taking his shoe off. Yes, sir. What was that? What did that mean, preacher? That meant, I know it's strange, but I tell you what, you go into a loan office, you buy you a new car, they flip them out. But they, you go in, they say, well, your payment's going to be so and such and such for 25 years, and uh, you, you think you can pay it? You, are you going to pay it? And the first thing you do is reach down, take your shoe off, and hand it to them. They call the nut wagon and say, get him out of there. But that's strange. What I tell you what, I give you my word. Shoes were important back then. This is how serious I am. I'm willing to walk barefooted just to show you that I'm a man of my word. Amen. So he took his shoe off, Norman did, and handed it to Boaz. Now, what I said, I said all of that to say this. We got Paul standing before Agrippa. And Satan almost now persuades me to be a Christian. We got the thief on the cross mocking Jesus. 
in his dying breath. So close could have accepted Jesus. But you know, I believe with all of my heart, he'll spend eternity in hell because he mocked Jesus. But this man that's only mentioned here in this short book of Ruth, the writers don't even take the time to give him a name. Missed out on one of the greatest blessings ever. The Word of God said, what would it profit a man if he had gained the whole world and lose his soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Norman looked at Boaz and he said, I would, but I'm afraid it would mar my inheritance or mess up my inheritance. Norman was more concerned. God had already had a, 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 a plan put together. God was going to redeem his people, Chris. Yeah. God was going to send somebody. Yeah. And he had men lined up even before they was born yeah. to be a part of his plan. Boaz was so happy. The Word of God said that he took Ruth, married Ruth, and in time they had a son. Would you turn over to chapter 4 of Ruth? The Bible said that they had, come on Jessica, Roseanne. Ruth and Boaz had a son. And all the people were in the gate. And the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is coming to thy house like Rachel and Leah. Which two did build the house of Israel? Listen to me. And do thou worthily in Ephra and be famous in Bethlehem. That let thy house be and let thy house be like the house of Perez whom Tamar, Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. Same chapter, Chris. Yeah. Same chapter as where Norman refused to be a part of the plan. So Boaz took Ruth, she and his wife, and when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. The woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which has not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. He shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine own age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. The Word of God says, And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom. This is a grandma. And became nurse to it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. They called his name Obed. Norman's name, Zach, never mentioned. Never mentioned. Roseanne, he was so close. He was so close to being part of God's plan. Norman's name, never mentioned. Now, for you young Christians, listen. What happened? Verse 18, you'll recognize it, you young Christians and young Bible readers. Don't know much about Obed. And you don't know a whole lot about Hezron and Ram and Amenadab. But there's a name here that you'll recognize. And the Bible said, There is a son born to Naomi, 
and they call his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse. The father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez beget Hezron. Hezron beget Ram. Ram beget Amenadab. And Amenadab beget Nashon. And Nashon beget Salmon. Great name there. Great name. James don't mean a whole lot. But through all of those names, we're getting closer, getting closer to us. And Salmon begat, and begat means to father. Salmon begat Boaz. And Boaz begat Obed. Now listen, Obed, Obed begat Jesse and Jesse beget David. Norman's name could have been right there yeah. in verse 21. Yeah. He said, Oh, well, no, I don't want to take the chance of more in my inheritance. Huh? What do you think about that, Zach? find that same genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. Norman was so close. Chris, Bobby just said, everything in this life is temporal. Yeah. It's going to burn up. Yeah. It's going to burn up. It's going to pass away. And we're going to stand before God in our flesh. Our souls is going to stand before with nothing but what we are. Not any good deed that we've done. Billy Graham, I would say, in my opinion, one of the best men of God since Bible times. But you know what? All the good work that he done led hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord. Maybe even over a million. But all of that don't matter. When he stands before God, it'll be through mercy and grace that the righteous judge says, Enter in, my good and faithful servant. We've got people all around us so close to being part of God's plan but they're so wrapped up in this life and the things of this life. Church and God is very low on their priority list. And it's going to cost them. It's going to cost them, Chris. Norman missed out, didn't he? Norman missed out. Because Boaz, this Boaz was a pop off to King David. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Old Norman's name could have been there. He had the right, Roseanne. He had the right. But he was worried about his inheritance to be part of the plan. Father, we come before you tonight and we're so thankful for your precious word. So thankful, Lord, that you blessed us, Lord with the privilege to preach tonight. One more time, as that said, under the leadership of thy spirit. Father, I believe we're all close. I believe we're all close. I believe, Lord, it'll be a short time that you will return. Father, help us tonight, Lord, we just wouldn't be close. Paul told Agrippa. He said, Agrippa, I would rather, instead of being almost, I would rather you be all together. So Lord, help us tonight, Lord, that we'd be all together. We wouldn't just say that we was close. 
being close is dangerous. Father, help us to be ready. Move on our loss, Lord. And God, as we tried to preach here in the fourth chapter of Ruth, help us, Lord, not to miss out on many blessings because we might find things of this world more valuable than following you. Tonight, Lord, we've got unsaved in the building. I'd ask, Lord, that you would give folks courage from the youngest child up. Give them courage right now to say, I know I'm close. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to go to that terrible place called hell. Father, move as only you can. Give folks courage to follow you, Lord. Give Christians courage to step out and say, I'm tired of living this close. But I want to be all together. I don't want to be almost, but I want to be all together. Help us, Lord, to have courage to step out. In your name we pray. Amen. Before they sing, Jesse could correct me. Man, I don't like gloom and doom because, Chris, we passed from darkness into his marvelous light. So we ain't got a reason to be gloom and doom. But I've been told throughout my life that DuPont plant, which is not DuPont anymore, is one of the most dangerous places in the world. And I've been told before, and I don't know if it's still that way, Jesse could correct us because that's where he works. If a terrorist, terrorist would get in there, just a short period of time we could all be wiped out that's close is it still that way Jesse we don't know the Lord could come back or we'd be taken out some other way it could happen I don't want to be almost to you. I want to be all together. I don't want to miss out like Norman missed out. How about you? Sing it. Oh, no, it's perfect. 